All right, welcome back to the channel, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good one so far. Um, I came across a video from uh, Secret Base, and this is a long one. It's called Michael Jordan Ruining the Cavaliers Needs a Deep Rewind. And it's uh, called Chosen Chapter 2. Now, um, from what I checked out, uh, Chapter 1 was just kind of like a rundown history of the Cavaliers. And I don't know what Chapter 3 is. I assume that's when LeBron comes to Cleveland. But I wanted to focus on this, Michael Jordan Ruining the Cavaliers, because that sounds like fun. So... Uh, this being one of those long ones, I highly suggest y'all get a drink, get some snacks, get cozy, because we're going to be in this one for the long haul. And uh, I've been getting demands for doing some longer form uh, reactions, and that's all good with me, because I get to kick back and relax and just kind of enjoy it when we do this. So, as always, I'm going to link the original uh, Secret Base video down below in the description. So if you want to watch it without my commentary, go right ahead. Great channel. Highly recommend it. And uh, everybody else, please leave this video a like. It always helps. And it, yeah, I can't like, I can't tell you how much that little action helps. So yeah, I appreciate it every time, you guys. Um, yeah, without further ado, if you guys are ready, let's do it. If not, pause and come back. Grab your snacks, grab your drinks. Here we go. It's June 19th, 2016. Here in Oakland, California, the Cleveland Cavaliers stand just seconds away from winning game seven of the NBA Finals against the Golden State Warriors. This would be the Cavs' first championship in 46 years of existence, an achievement that looked impossible by the end of the Ted Stepien era. Nobody in 1983 expected the Cleveland Cavaliers to keep existing let alone win a title. A lot has changed, and the line between then and now swerves in every direction. Before we witness this special Cavs moment, we need to recall the second chapter in franchise history, its rescue and rebirth under new leadership, and its second death at the hands of those notorious reapers. Bad moves, bad luck, Daddy Ferry. and one very bad man. Yeah. <laughs> we need to rewind. Before we get into this, because of the way Jordan punished the Cavs all those years, I really thought LeBron James was going to be the guy who helps them heal. You know, like I thought they were going to win some championships with LeBron in Cleveland. And, you know, it would make up for what Jordan did to them because Jordan just crushed their dreams, crushed their dreams for like, you know, 15, 15, 16 years. But it didn't work out that way. Instead, LeBron just broke their hearts twice. Nice retro theme there. I like that. Less than a minute ago, the wizardly point guard Cleveland drafted in 2011 made the biggest play of his career. Kyrie Irving's heroic three-pointer bought the Cavs a late three-point lead with a title on the line. But the Warriors immediately came the other way with a chance to pull even. This screen set up a threatening mismatch. Scary moment for Cavs fans, and we will see how it went. But first, let's talk about how these men got here. <laughs> Stories that connect to the second era of Cavaliers history. Yep. Starting with Kevin Love. Oh, let's do it. Go Let, back a bit. Let's give him some praise for a damn change. And you'll see that the Cavs acquired Love in a 2014 trade. It was a welcome change for the big guy. Love was an outstanding power forward in college at UCLA, even if he hadn't quite figured out his facial hair. His <laughs> reward for collegiate excellence was getting picked fifth in the 2008 draft, consigned to begin his pro career with the lowly Minnesota Timberwolves. For his first six seasons, Love played elite ball, often at an all-star or all-NBA level, alone. Yeah, it's crazy they did the same thing to KG. Uh, they did the same thing to Kevin Love that they did to KG. Like, he was just all alone out there on, on, on the Wolves. And he had to go elsewhere in order to win. 
The Wolves didn't surround him with talent and never made the postseason. Is that Mike Miller? That's Mike Miller, huh? They wasted the charity of high draft position, the opportunity to choose players. Love grew frustrated after six seasons stuck losing in Minnesota, but he feared penalty if he demanded a trade. Thankfully for Kevin, the Cavaliers desired a ready-made star and dealt the Wolves some promising young players so they could have him. In a way, this trade resembled those of the old bad Cavs from chapter one. Cleveland punted on tomorrow's potential to summon veteran talent today. Yeah. But in this case, the that's what the Lakers are doing right now. Modern day Cavaliers traded with sound purpose at the right moment. In love, Cleveland acquired a leading rebounder, a knockdown shooter, the kind of potent third option a great team needs. The, the guy was a beast in the post. I can't recall how many times before he went to Cleveland, he was putting up 25 and 20. Yeah, that's 20 rebounds. He was doing it just like it was nothing for him. And a couple years later, here was Love defending a pivotal possession with a title on the line. Ooh, we went for that Good reach. Trade. That is an important development in Cavaliers history. Trades allow a franchise to transfer players and assets from another team, but only by offering the same in return. That means sacrifice, and it means disruption. So you got to deal at the right time for the right reasons. It's like alchemy. We know how ill-considered trades soured the first chapter of Cavaliers history. We left our last rewind in 1983 with a barren, hopeless roster all but packed up for a move to Toronto. Wow. Let's remember how the Cavs survived Ted Stepien. That then makes me kind of curious about that first video met whole new forms of devastation. It's gonna get black and white for a sec. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> During World War I, the United States passed the Trading with the Enemy Act, which authorized the seizure of German assets in the US. This is how Bayer lost its American patent for aspirin. After wow. prohibition, an American brewer named George Gund Jr capitalized heavily on the purchase and sale of this so-called alien property, like the decaf coffee brand now known as Sanka. Decades later, two of Gunn's sons, George III and Gordon, invested that wealth in pro sports, hockey in particular. By the early 1980s, the Gunn's owned Richfield Coliseum, which served as the suburban Ohio home of the Cleveland... Age check. Name that band. <laughs> I bet you young ones will have no idea. Cavaliers, although not for long. After stripping the team bare, obliterating future draft rights, and infuriating the fan base, Cavs owner Ted Stepien was 99.9% .9 set on moving the franchise to Toronto. The team had a new name and everything. The brothers Gund had tried to stop the move. Ted insisted he heard their offer in good faith. They just couldn't work things out. It's crazy because, okay, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the year that it happened, but it wasn't until at least the mid-90s where Canada got a team, and it was Toronto and Vancouver got the first teams. But to think he was talking about doing this in 83, I didn't know that. But in a surprise turn late in the 83 season, Stepien relented. Gordon and George Gund put up $20 million or so to not only keep the Cavs at their arena, but also take over Stepien's advertising business. The Cleveland Cavaliers were saved. Ted Stepien was gone. But as we've established, Stepien had not only damaged the existing team, but hampered its future by selling off first round draft picks in the years to come. Oh yeah. Stepien's lasting NBA legacy is a bylaw that forbids teams from trading future first round selections in consecutive drafts. It persists to this day. Interesting. The more immediate effects of his mismanagement needed a more immediate remedy. So NBA <laughs> lawyer David Stern made an unusual arrangement. NBA lawyer David Stern. Wow. The Cavs didn't receive their original picks back but the Guns were allowed to pay half a million dollars to add a bonus Cavaliers pick to each of the next four drafts. 
This was an unprecedented act of pity, and some owners didn't like it, but everyone knew the post-Stepian calves were embarking on a unique rescue mission. While George III carried on with the family's hockey investments, his brother Gordon became the face and principal decision maker for that calves rescue. Gordon Gund is an interesting guy. Accomplished, gregarious, philanthropic beyond measure. Well, it looks like a dude who doesn't put up with bullshit. And by the time he took over the calves, completely unable to see because of a genetic condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Damn. Even without sight, Gund became famous among reporters for his ability to connect with people and to command a room with incredible hearing and the ability to memorize the positions of people around him. For everything else, there was Joe Tate. In the summer of 83, Gund rehired the beloved announcer Stepien had driven out of Cleveland for being too critical. The voice of the Cavaliers stuck around until his retirement just a few years ago, wow. as it was meant to be. Gund That's crazy. So they were doing that even back then. Too critical? Get out. Speak the narrative we want you to speak, or else get the hell out of here. Entrusted Tate's voice with matters of friendship, like mapping out the food on his dinner plate. That's a cool quote. You could see the game. And that coming from a blind man. And when it came to business, the owner knew he could count on Tate's radio call for an honest, vivid assessment of the Encore product. I respect that. That product was kind of rough at the outset. World Be Free was the top performer in those early days, a scoring star too cool to worry about his hairline. Free <laughs> did his best to put on a show during the mid-80s transition period. Another post-Stepian holdover was executive Harry Weltman, who stayed on as GM and gave George Carl his first NBA coaching job with the 84-85 Cavaliers. Learned something today. I had no idea that's where George Carl started. Those Cavs finished 36 and 46 and actually made the postseason. Free led his younger teammates in a shockingly competitive series against Larry Bird's Celtics, but Cleveland fell in game four against the eventual Eastern champions. To keep improving, the Cavs needed to nail the draft selections they bought from the NBA. As you know, that is how losing, unappealing teams fix themselves. Yep. By choosing new players who probably wouldn't have chosen them. Hey, they made the playoffs at least, though. But the front office led by Weltman wasted those first three bonus picks. Future all-star Doc Rivers sat on the board when the Cavs picked 24th in 1983, but they passed on him. The Cavs famously lacked their fourth pick in the loaded 1980. Who did they pick in 83? Yeah, 84, we all know this. Four draft and thus couldn't claim Charles Barkley, but they still could have snagged John Stockton at 12 and chose not to. In 1985, the Cavaliers... That would have been interesting. But they ended up with Mark Price, and Mark Price was not exactly Stockton, but he was, he was pretty damn close. Lears had the chance to pick Carl Malone ninth. Instead, they selected Cleveland's own Charles Oakley, a fine enough pick. <laughs> so they could have had they could have had Stockton and Malone. Wow. So they dealt him to the Chicago Bulls in an inexplicable trade. By the end of the 85-86 season, the Cavs were a normal basketball team, but not a good one. So they started from scratch. Weltman fired coach Carl, and then he got fired himself. Gordon Gund had new leadership in wow. mind. Wayne Embry was once an Ohio Hoops star, high school, college, and pro. He went on to win a title with the 1968 Celtics and soon after retirement, became the NBA's first black general manager with the excellent Milwaukee Bucks of the early 70s. Dude, he's got that young James Earl Jones look to him. When the Cavs job opened up in 1986, Embry was working for the Indiana Pacers. Despite Vice his President. superior resume, Embry got passed over for a promotion to Indiana's open GM job, which instead went to Donnie Walsh. So when Gund came calling, Embry took an interview. It went poorly. A Cavs board member asked him a ridiculous question, albeit far from the worst racism Embry dealt with in his career before or after. 
Gunn kept pressing, though, and Embry eventually assented, agreeing to take over as Cavs general manager right after the 86 draft. Cleveland needed him sooner than that, though. It was a really big draft. The Cavs still owed their seventh pick to Dallas, but the post stepian recovery scheme allowed them to purchase the pick right after it, number eight. Oh, okay. And they'd also heard the Philadelphia 76ers were willing to trade away the number one pick. So, with permission from the Pacers, Embry helped run two draft nights at once from his office in Indiana. For Cleveland, he approved a trade to get that number one pick, sending young Cavalier Roy Hinson to Philly for the opportunity to draft the best center in college basketball. Yeah, Brad Doherty was UNC's was beast. Brad Doherty. The eighth pick was a no-brainer. Versatile swingman Ron Harper was born and raised in Dayton, then broke some Embry scoring records at Miami of Ohio. Yeah, Ron Harper was one of those dudes before injury. He was very Jordan-esque. I ain't going to say he's like Jordan, but he re- he reminded a lot of us of Jordan. And it's cool that they won three titles together. Perfect fit. With his remote work complete, Embry spent the rest of the night on Pacers business. He set up a trade to acquire the Dallas Mavericks' 25th pick so Indiana could grab Georgia Tech point guard Mark Price. Just one thing. While Embry was on the phone conducting Pacers business, the Cavs were speaking to a different Mavericks executive, and they finalized a trade first. So without his input, Mark Price ended up with Embry's new team. That was kind of awkward for our friend Wayne who got reamed out on his last day with the Pacers (laughs) and waited a while for absolution. Oh, well, Dallas kind of owed the Cavs for all that steppy and nonsense anyway. Once Embry officially moved to Cleveland, there sat the bounty of young talent he'd helped assemble. Doherty, Harper, and Price, and the Cavs finally signed their 1985 draft pick, John Hot Rod Williams who'd been away for a year dealing with the legal fallout of a college point shaving scandal. Oh, wow. These four players, all recruited through the draft, would play a huge role in the Cavs' return to excellence. All that in two years? Hot Rod, Price, Harper, and Doherty. That's a hell of a turnaround. Doherty was the centerpiece with refined skills down low. Hot Rod, his perfect complement at forward. Harper provided scoring from the wing, and Price would soon prove his brilliance at point guard. To lead them, Embry hired Lenny Wilkins, nice. once an all-star and early Cavs player who'd since become a title-winning head coach. Yeah, great coach. And yes, a black person. Eat shit, guy from the job interview. Eat shit, racist hate mail. Wait. Uh, yeah, this was the 80s. But I refused to be intimidated by him, the usual hate mail. I was eager to prove my critics wrong. Crazy. He was already proven by then, man. It's so stupid. It's crazy. I got no room for any kind of racism in my life. It's so dumb. In year one, the Cavs lost games while the youngsters got their feet wet, but they still played some of the NBA's stingiest defense. In year two, Embry accelerated progress by trading future for present, like the Cavs of yesteryear, but with actual purpose. Cleveland sacrificed some young players, including sharp rookie Kevin Johnson, to acquire established veteran contributors. Larry Nance and Mike Sanders fleshed out an imposing front court rotation, one that allowed Coach Wilkins the flexibility to bring Hot Rod off the bench if he wanted. That did the trick. The 88 Cavs secured the franchise's first winning record since the 70s and returned to the playoffs. At long last, Cleveland was ready to compete. But with whom? Well. What a lead up. 14 and a half minutes in. I hope you all are still with me. This is actually really interesting, though. Even even without the mention of Michael Jordan. This was a a cool little history lesson. Let's do it. During the same years the Cavs pieced together a playoff-ready roster, their divisional neighbors rode a one-man skyrocket to the same point. The Chicago Bulls <laughs> chose Michael Jordan with the third selection in the 1984 NBA draft. By 1988, Jordan had become, 
you know, the best player in the NBA, a phenom and an artist, the <laughs> clear-cut league MVP and defensive player of the year at age 25. It's crazy if you think about it because how much work went into building that Cavs team and then you have a one-man juggernaut that's just going to rip your dreams out. One dude that you cannot stop. Freaking Michael Jordan, dude. Draft picks are the gift that keeps on giving. As long as you don't give away the gifts, Ted. <laughs> In contrast to the balanced Cavs attack, the 87-88 Bulls watched Jordan average 35 points a night for the second straight season. Just an astounding portion of scoring for one person. He'd hung 52 on the shorthanded Cavs during a regular season win in December. In a closer March contest, the Cavs swarmed Jordan's last shot. Oh, but man. Charles Oakley. Is that four players on him? Hold up. March contest, the Cavs. Okay. <laughs> All right, one on one. We got one coming in, two coming in. It's going to be a, a quadruple team. Swarmed Jordan's last Look at that trap. Holy crap. Shot, but Charles Oakley, the Burley. Oh, garbage. okay, okay. He missed it. But yeah, yeah. You quadruple team, someone's open for the rebound. Collector originally drafted by Cleveland. Wow. Tipped home the game winner. MJ did have some help. But Jordan's Bulls had been swiftly eliminated from the prior three postseasons. MJ had just one playoff game victory to his name, let alone a whole series win. So the MVP still had a lot to prove. He didn't want to be remembered as just a scorer for an also-ran team. Yeah, no worries, buddy. Six championships changed that narrative. To level up his reputation, Jordan would have to thwart these six-seeded Cavaliers who were embarking on their own maiden playoff voyage. And good lord could that man thwart. 88 playoffs, all right. Ron Harper was Cleveland's MJ specialist, but Harper had to sit game one with a nagging ankle injury. Jordan hung 50 points on the second string with Craig Elo. <laughs> Easy uh, Craig Elo, that's where it starts. Oh, man, because Harper was supposed to be the assignment. I'm sorry, I just got to hear the name. 50 points on, jo on uh, Craig Elo. We just, I, just, something about it just makes me smile. Jordan hung 50 points on the second stringer, Craig Elo. <laughs> Easy Bulls win. Harper returned for game two, but look at him trying to fight over his screen. He wasn't himself. Oh, no. Before yeah, that he's, game, he's MJ suggested he'd rather face Harper than Elo, which felt a little like trolling, but Jordan dropped 55 in another Bulls win, so... He, he was trolling. He was trolling. He was pushing Ron Harper to play injured because he pissed him off. That was a smart move, too. I had to disagree. And while MJ's excellence headlined the two wins in Chicago, the former Cleveland draft pick, Oakley, pitched in as a rebounder and second scorer. Back in Cleveland for game three, Mark Price broke out for 31 points to command a home win in his first career home playoff game. Guys, I can't emphasize enough how good and underappreciated Mark Price is. In game four, Harper took over. That was the beauty of these Cavs. Anyone could take the reins. Harper 30. Jordan put up his usual absurd numbers, but didn't get enough help from people like Charles Oakley. In the closing seconds of game four, Harper poached Scottie Pippen's inbound pass to Dave Corzine. Oof. Some tip. Can I take another look at that? Didn't get enough help from people like Charles Oakley. Okay. In the closing seconds of game. Oof, right in the traffic. Game four. Okay. No. Harper poached Scottie Pippen's in oh, okay. pass to Dave Corsi. Yeah, good. Some typical Sorry, good defense. Defense to secure the series tie. After a dormant decade, the playoff atmosphere crackled to life at Richfield Coliseum. It was palpable on the broadcast. Imagine your Gordon Gunn hearing this ecstatic Joe Tate call over the roar of the crowd. Jordan goes with seven seconds remaining. Goes to the line and they're going to Chicago on Sunday. Notice one little difference here is if this was LeBron James, he would have left the game and walked out on his team. What's Jordan do? Sits on the bench. Goes to the line and they're going to Chicago on Sunday. 
But Chicago hosted the final winner go home game five, and that decisive contest foreshadowed some of the dynasty to come. Jordan performed masterfully as usual, and Pippen, Chicago's unsung rookie, justified a surprised last second starting nod, leading a comeback with the best performance of his young career. Cleveland had life in the final minute. Harper picked Jordan's pocket to feed a clean price pull up that cut Chicago's lead to three. But next time down, Jordan and Oakley busted ass on the board nice. to ensure game five would not come down to the last possession. Two icy Jordan free throws clinched his first series victory, denying Wayne Embry's calves the same. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why does this make me laugh? Series victory. Deny <laughs> Why does that make me laugh right now? Time out, man. Time out. <laughs> Wayne Embry's calves the same. But more opportunities ahead. Embry's roster had playoff experience now, and they were well positioned to run it back in 89. Only one rotation player departed, although given the nascent rivalry with MJ and the Bulls, it is notable that it was a two guard. Young Real quick, um, because there are certain weirdos out there that say like the Pistons owned the Bulls. It's not true because the Bulls eventually overcame them. And this this thought just sparked because I was thinking, what happened in 88 after this? Oh, yeah. Pistons beat, beat the Bulls. Um, now, you can say Jordan owned the Cavs because the Cavs never beat Jordan. It never happened. It, like, it never happened in the playoffs. So Jordan owned them his entire career. And it never flopped. It never flip-flopped. But eventually, Jordan overcame the Pistons. And it never looked back, never lost to them ever again. So it's very different, very different, if uh, if you understand the game here. Shooter Del Curry. Cleveland left Curry unprotected in an expansion draft. And Wait, was that Del Curry? Nation rivalry with MJ and the Bulls, it is notable that it was a two-guard. Young shooter Del Curry. Nice. Cleveland left Curry unprotected in an expansion draft, and the brand-new Charlotte Hornets snagged him. Cleveland stayed otherwise intact for the 89 campaign. The kids improved, the recently acquired vets got a full training camp, and the Cavs found sweet harmony. Wilkins commanded the second most efficient defense in the whole NBA. Nance's skyscraping blocks highlighted Cleveland's impenetrable interior. Y'all remember Larry Nance in the uh, dunk contest? By February, the team once known as the Cleveland Cadavers held the league's best record. Wilkins thus got to coach the 89 Eastern All-Stars, which included a chunk of his own squad. Cleveland's keystone, Doherty, made his second straight appearance. Nance joined in for the first time since yeah, 85. Price. And the third Cavalier All-Star really turned heads. That, that's crazy. There's Neek, MJ. I'm just looking for another bull. There's no other Chicago Bulls, so three All-Stars. Jordan's taking down three all-stars. Mark Price, the little guy whose 86 trade acquisition got Wayne Embry in trouble with the Pacers, burst out as one of the best point guards in the NBA. I considered him to be the best Cleveland Cavalier at that time. Dead eye shooting the ball, shifty handling and dishing it among the well-balanced Cavalier attack. No less than Isaiah Thomas, Fellow all-star point guard from the despised Detroit Pistons was floored by Price's performance. Isaiah saw a guard quicker than himself <laughs> who'd risen from... That little shaken flat-out play. He's faster than me, and he is quicker than me. Wow. Second round pick to start incredibly fast. That little shit could flat-out play. With all this going for them, the Cavs were the team on the rise. Magic Johnson had dubbed Cleveland the team of the 90s, but some experts were impressed right now, even predicting a title in 89. Isaiah's defending... That's East a funny thing. A lot of people don't realize the Cavs were supposed to beat the Bulls, but it's the Jordan factor. He overcame. Eastern champion Pistons didn't love that and made a point to not only beat the Cavs, but beat them up. In late February, Detroit big guy Rick Mahorn concussed Price with a deliberate-looking elbow. Yeah, they would. And Price wasn't quite himself the rest of the year. 
Before season's end, Detroit pulled ahead of Cleveland in the standings. Look at that. And where's Chicago? Way down here. It's crazy. Yeah, they were right there. Right there with Detroit back then. Cleveland was really good. Solid team. But the playoffs mattered most. And before any potential Pistons matchup, the Cavs had to face a familiar first round opponent in unfamiliar circumstances. Uh oh. Say hi to your daddy. Oh, this is the shot on, 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 is this 89? Shot on Elo? Yeah, yeah, this is. <laughs> These were different bulls. Oakley was gone. MJ was at odds with coach Doug Collins and Chicago had regressed to just 47 wins. Unlike in 88, Cleveland entered with a superior record, a convincing win streak against the Bulls, and home court advantage at Richfield. Some expected a Cavs sweep, but not for long. Interestingly enough, it turns out Jordan wasn't really at odds with Collins. Um, it was more so, it was Jerry Krause that was at odds with, with Collins. MJ never said a bad thing about him. And in fact, he didn't like Phil Jackson in the beginning. He, he liked Doug Collins. But, you know, obviously Phil Jackson ended up being the, the better choice. Hats off to you, Jerry Krause, for that one. You were dead right. And Tex Winter for introducing the triangle offense to the team. Price missed game one of the five-game series with an injured groin. Craig Elo started in place of Cleveland's leading scorer, and the Cavs just weren't the same team. Chicago stole game one against an opponent Pippen described as dead without price. Damn. But Harper broke out in game two to secure a split at home, and after losing game three, the Cavs pulled off the unexpected in game four at Chicago Stadium. Jordan dropped 50 on the Cavs yet again, but looked furious at himself for missing two of four crucial free throws in the last minute of regulation. Dude, that is not like him. That is not like him. He usually shot in the low, uh, in the high, high 80s, free throw wise. In the midst of a disappointing offensive series, Doherty at least outshot Jordan from the free throw line in game four, including these two even keeled makes that sent the game to overtime. In OT, Jordan fouled out, and the combined scoring of Nance, Price, and Harper carried the day. So Cleveland set up another do-or-die game five, at home this time, a major fork in the road. Wilkins had by this point committed to a taller lineup, one that forced Pippen to guard Larry Nance. Mm -hmm. But game five was still an off night for Cleveland's bigs, who carried a variety of injuries. The guards kept the Cavs in it. Gritty performances from Harper and Price and heroic scoring from the sixth man, Craig Elo. Yeah, but Sh we, we, we diss on Elo because the thing that made him famous is the shot on Elo. Good. The Bulls win. However, Craig Elo was actually a solid player. Chicago took a lead into the final minute after Jordan found Pippen for a corner three to just beat the shot clock. But Elo responded with a three of his own and then got payback for this painful Jordan bucket. Wilkins drew up a gorgeous inbound give and go to spring Elo for the double clutch finish that put the Cavs up one with just seconds left. One stop would earn this Cleveland squad their first playoff series victory.
Wilkins stuck Elo on Jordan to get that stop, and he did not. MJ hung in the air seemingly forever to cap a 44-point outing with this series-deciding bucket. Man, okay. Y'all know that the, the bucket's about to drop here. Let's just look at what he had to go through to get open for the ball. As I recall the 2011 finals game four where LeBron is just sitting in a corner, not even trying to get open. Look at the amount of effort MJ has to go through to get this ball because he wanted the damn ball. All right. You got Elo on him, but pay attention here. Okay. He did not. MJ hung in the yep, air. Yep. You're going to leave your guy. Screw that. We ain't worried about him. See, All right. Now we got Jordan sandwiched in between two good defenders. For All right. He's got a, he's got a, no, I don't want to say push off, but he's, he's, he's doing a fake, you know, so he's faking going up through, but he's going to actually push and go straight, straight to the ball. You want the ball, you go to the ball. Cap of Bang. 40. All right. So he, now he's got three defenders potentially that, that can, that can stop him. Three seconds on a freaking clock. Four point out. Look at this. He got everybody off guard just by that one move. Nobody expected him to split. MJ hung in the air, seemingly... This move right here, because he does a fake. You see that fake? He's leaning. So he's faking that he's leaning, and he's going to go around the outside to get the ball. Nobody expected him to cut straight to the ball, because that takes a lot of balls to do. Bang! Right there. That's the move. He faked everybody out. Look, off, off balance... He took a couple of extra, extra little trots there to, to realize what's going on. And by that point, too late. MJ's getting his ball. 44. See? Because you'd think he'd go around the outside to catch the ball over here. And that would be a risky move. Point it was just brilliant. It. Now you got three defenders on him. Thing. Everyone's off balance. Because not only did he... <laughs> he got him off balance twice. It's, it's So much happens in such a short little time here. So let's just... Uh, Let's just watch it in full. Sorry for the breakdown. I I, I, I nerd out at this stuff a lot. I'm in the air. All right. Fake. Forever Got you. Now you think, point. you know, maybe he's going to keep going. Nope, he's not. He did a he did a fake and then another fake. Outing Got you. With now you're off balance. This and then he has to hang to the point because because Elo caught up to him. I like once again. Not dissing you, Elo. That was good defense. You did everything you possibly could. But back in 89, Jordan can outhang anybody. Outing bucket. Um, so that's what he did. Point outing with this series deciding bucket. Because um, if that was a straight up jumper, Elo would have blocked the shit out of that shot. But Jordan had to hang in the air long enough for, for Elo to jump and pass by him to get that shot off. That's that's one of those things that made that made young MJ so special. He can shoot it on the way up or he can shoot it on the way down. Either way, you're not going to block him. A moment so famous that people just call it the shot. One year after failing to upset the Bulls, Cleveland got upset by the Bulls. <laughs> they couldn't believe yep. it. Said Ron Harper, it is not over. I refuse to believe it is over. Now nah, you got to just team up with MJ, bro. It ain't going to work. It didn't work. And, uh, yeah, it just, I mean, at that point, Jordan was just their daddy. There's, there's no other way around it. Just like, uh, just like Denver or Joker is, uh, is LeBron's daddy. You just, you can't deny it at a certain point. Like that's just ownership. At least for him, it was over. Harper had always stood out went to the, from the splendid 86 draft class that formed this team's foundation. He goes to the Clippers after this, right? Or is there a team in between? I think he went to the Clippers after this. Ron was a local guy with a newly minted local agent, Mark Termini, who fought hard for one of his first clients. Harper actually held out for a couple weeks of his first Cavs training camp until Termini and Wayne Embry could reach terms on a rookie contract. And playing where you grew up has its downsides. Embry and the Cavs heard rumors about Harper's friends and irritated him by fussing over the company he kept. Really? 
Really? Now 25 years old, Harper opened the 89-90 season on the verge of a breakout, Cleveland's best hope of rebounding from that brutal playoff defeat. Sparkling early numbers put Ron on pace to become an NBA All-Star in the same state where he'd won high school and college honors. But the voices whispering to Cavs management grew louder. League security got word that the DEA was poking around Harper's friends, that he might actually get subpoenaed as part of an investigation. Sports executives at the time were particularly sensitive to drug scandals. The NBA was still reeling from oh, Len yeah. Bias's tragic death in 1986. And, uh, a take I had wrong, apparently, about Len Bias was I figured he had issues with drugs in general. But I got corrected in the comments of a previous video that said he had no drug issues. It was just uh, a, an out-of-control celebration that he got drafted that caused this. So I thought that was just a blowout, you know, like, and it was like a regular problem. But no, apparently, like, you know, that was a one-off celebration, and it just went wrong. And he, uh, he sadly didn't make it. In Cleveland, Don Rogers of the Browns died from an overdose the same month as Bias. Another Brown, Kevin Mack, got an obscene prison sentence for a cocaine bust that very summer. Some former Cavaliers had been part of the sprawling Phoenix Suns drug scandal in 87. Oh, yeah. So when he was apprised of a potential investigation, Gordon Gunn made up his mind instantly. Yeah, I saw a video about that recently. Um, actually, it was in January. I can remember it so clear because that's when uh, I had my, my calf tear. And um, the only way for me to, to, uh, to bathe at that point was to like, it took me a while, I'm not going to lie. It took me about a week until I could do it proper. But to like find a way to crutch myself into the bathtub and like basically wash myself like uh, like cowboy style, you know, like like just with like a rag on a fucking stick. And um, I watched a video about the all the cocaine issues with the Phoenix Suns in the, the late 70s and the 80s. I was baffled. Um, but yeah, wow, that takes me back. Man, appreciate appreciate the little things, guys. I couldn't walk for like a month there. I'm so glad I can walk. <laughs> like something so simple. I could I could fucking walk. It's great. It's great. Embry dithered and Wilkins pleaded, but Gund wanted Harper gone. Now. Embry was compelled to trade a celebrated local talent at the top of his game. Yeah, that was a big mistake. The decision made everyone miserable. Coach Wilkins especially. And the eventual trade was grim in basketball terms, too. This is not the name you want invoked after a Cleveland transaction. Wow. The desperate Cavs found their taker in the mediocre Los Angeles Clippers, who also milked some draft picks out of the team. Yeah, because at that point, wasn't um, Harper their leading scorer? So, okay. Clippers received three draft picks. So they're getting rid of their leading score and three draft picks for who? Who did they get? Harper, who had no say in his move, played some excellent years in L.A. even after tearing his ACL. Yeah, he was still good. Later on, when he gained free agency, Harper chose a new role alongside this old friend of the cat. <laughs> the drug stuff never amounted to much. The wow. agent, Mark Termini, would never let the Cavs forget that. Harper maintains to this day that the Cavs could have won titles in the 90s if they only kept him. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but they'd still have to get through MJ and the Bulls, and the Bulls only got stronger. Uh, I mean, maybe by, like, they could have competed against Orlando. Um, and... Uh, 95 was it they had a 95 playoffs maybe they could have competed against orlando then or competed what? against the knicks um while jordan was retired let's see what actually happened cleveland's return package in the 89 trade centered around an important figure in our story danny Ferry. oh no that's right danny ferry for Ron Harper, for a prime, healthy Ron Harper and three draft picks. Yeah, 
Damn, if I was a Cleveland fan, I'd be so pissed off about that one. L.A. had picked the Duke star second in the 1989 draft, but Ferry bailed on them to play in Italy, and he would not return in season. Embry predicted, or perhaps prayed, that Ferry would be worth the delay, like some others who didn't join the NBA immediately. While they waited, the sullen, depleted 1990 Cavaliers struggled. They hadn't exactly planned for Harper's departure, having lost utility forward Mike Sanders and backfilled with young guys meant for the bench. Like yeah, there's young Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr and Chucky Brown. And to make matters worse, health betrayed our protagonists. Doherty and Nance endured difficult recoveries from off-season surgery, and Price opened the season hurt as well. Cleveland ended up losing 40 games, including all five of their meetings with the Bulls. Ouch. Yeah, talk as about if, dominance and ownership at that point. <laughs> to jab his thumb in the hole vacated by Ron Harper, Jordan scored a career-high 69 points against... Jordan? <laughs> Craig Elo and friends at Richfield in yeah. March. The Cavaliers made the points. playoffs, but the Sixers took care of them in the first round. Chicago and Detroit battled for the East while the Cavs could only watch. So after beating him in the playoffs two years in a row and the way he beat him in uh, 89, like as if that wasn't insulting enough, he, Jordan beats him all five games the, the, the next season and also puts up his highest scoring performance of his entire career with 69 points against them. Man, talk about insult to injury. The 91 season was worse. It took a substantial salary to retrieve Ferry from Europe. 34 million? Oh, because he was making more in Europe, I guess. Tony Kukoc said the same thing. He was making more in Europe, and he had to take a pay cut to go to the Bulls which is part of the reason why he didn't go right away when he was drafted, similar to Ferry. So I think us Americans have a misunderstanding and we think like, you know, poorly on that, but I get it. So you drafted me. Good for you. I'm a professional over here in this country and they're paying me more than you're willing to pay me. So I'm going to stay here for a while. I get it. And uh, Kukoc, there was also a, a war going on at that time. It was, it was kind of guerrilla warfare. And, um, he said he wanted to stay, you know, he's making more money anyways. So this way he can stay close to his family and make sure that they're, they're safe during the war out there. Sorry, side tidbit here. That deal plus a generous new contract to prevent restricted free agent Hot Rod Williams from departing put the Cavaliers well over the salary cap. Too bad, because while Ferry played an adequate enough career in Cleveland, his knees were in bad shape, and his performance never came close to justifying the Harper Yeah, trip. I was just about to say, he was good, but he was no prime Ron Harper. No offense. Hot Rod injured his foot early in the 91 season and ended up playing just 43 games. Price's year was cut short by a torn ACL. Lenny Wilkins' once elite defense fell below league average, and the Cavs finished just 33 and 49. The team of the 90s missed the 1991 playoffs. Jordan and company planted their flag in the decade by winning the title. <laughs> and then, you know, five more. Yeah, no big deal. No matter what the Cavaliers did, the Bulls never let them any closer than they got in 1989. But look at this. This is, this is just messed up. Four and two in 92, f swept them in 93, 94. So this was uh, with, with uh, Pippen fronting that. Okay, so they were, they were the worst team in the playoffs at that point. And, uh, oh, no, that's, that's, that's not necessarily true. Um, but they swept them in the first round because back then it was a five-game series. Oof. And it's not like Cleveland stayed bad. Lottery picked point guard Terrell Brandon brought some extra burst in 1992, and that was just icing on the cake of a bounce back year for the Vets. Price in particular looked shockingly great after ACL surgery, picking and rolling with a healthy front court. Anybody out there? I've, I've had a meniscus, and uh, I've got a um, pinched sciatica, and I also have, I've recovered from uh, a calf tear. Anybody out there with ACL issues? 
Let me know what that was like. What was the recovery like? Two Cavs won a regular season game by the largest margin in NBA history. Cleveland racked up 148 points without a single individual. 148 to 80? Cracking 20. A perfect encapsulation of the ensemble effort that made them Wow. Play. Those revitalized Cavs went on to win their first playoff series under Wilkins, with Doherty playing some of his best ball to outgun Drazen Petrovic in the Nets. Then came a grueling second round win against the fading Larry Bird Celtics. A bit later than expected, the Cavs had arrived. Unfortunately, the Bulls never yep. left. 1992 Eastern Conference Finals. Cleveland actually snatched an early road win against Chicago, but squandered it. They got <laughs> an uneven MJ outing in game six, but squandered it. Nance dominated game six and Price gutted through a bum ankle, but the point guard dribbled off his foot on a crucial play in the final minute. Damn. Yet another Cavalier season ended against Chicago at home in defeat. Sorry guys. The Harper trade haunted the Cavs not just because they lacked a star wing to battle MJ in that conference final loss, but because they felt stuck in place. Even though the 91-92 roster finally punched through to the conference finals and earned Embry executive of the year, it still wasn't enough to match Chicago, and high salary left little room to improve. Adding Gerald Wilk- Hold on. Salary cap, it will rise to 14 million in July but the Cavs payroll will be more than 17 million. Okay. Can you imagine that back then? Can you imagine that while we're in an era where people make $51 million a year, the entire team, the entire salary cap back then was less than 14 million. It was being upped to 14 million at this point. Imagine that. And high salary left little room to improve. And Michael Jordan is a billionaire, by the way. He didn't make his money playing basketball. He made his money doing other things because of how good he was at basketball. Adding Gerald Wilkins wasn't going to change Cleveland's fortune in the 1993s. Dominique's playoffs. brother. This time, the Bulls swept the Cavs in the second round. Despite a sprained wrist... Jordan ended that oh, series yeah. on yet another contested Yeah, I remember this one too. Not as crazy, but we all knew it watching this. And I was watching this game live. Jordan gets the ball in the post. Everything's on the line. And the Bulls swept the Cavs in the second round. And he's about to get double teamed as well. I believe it's you. Despite a sprained wrist. Right? Are you going to? Jordan ended that series. Oh, no. Okay. Right here. Yep, so here comes a double team. Yet another. And he just gets it off. I know it's blurry, but it was close. It was close. But MJ's fadeaway. Contesting Bang. dagger of a jump shot. In he front does of it again. Thousand heartbroken Cleveland fans. Again. Who's guarding him, though? Who's his main? Who was his main guy? Ah, uh, too blurry. Series on yet another contested dagger of a jump Not shot. Craig Elo. That's really what I was looking at. Y'all know what I was doing there. So I can't say he did that on Craig Elo this time. I believe this blurry figure right here is Craig Elo. In front of 21,000 heartbroken Cleveland fans. Again. This crowd is stunned. By the end <laughs> of its life, Richfield Coliseum belonged yep. to MJ. Even during Jordan's baseball days. Okay, just something funny right here. Michael Jordan should have bought the Cleveland Cavaliers when he retired. I think that would have been the funniest thing ever if he would have just retired and said, now I really own you. <laughs> you know, screw what he did with the Wizards. Screw, screw what he did with the Bobcats. Like he should have just, he should have just said, no, Cleveland, I am your daddy. Prevailed. The Cavs got a new coach in Mike Fratello and some new young contributors, but the front court injuries resurfaced. Chicago swept Cleveland again in the 1994 playoffs. Because of those injuries, 94 marked the final career games for both Nance and the much younger Doherty. Price and Hot Rod were the only members of that late 80s core to join the Cavs in their move to Gund Arena in downtown By the way, how cool was this court back then? Very ahead of their time. 
This actually looks kind of like uh, like an Olympics court. And to wear these jerseys, which I got to say have grown on me over the years. Coach Fratello leaned on younger lineups, but filled that new arena with the slowest, muddiest basketball you'll ever see. The Cavs settled into middling seasons that ended with either a first round exit or, in the case of 1997, defeat in a do or die game 82 of the regular season, which could have clinched the eight seed. Stung by the unfulfilled promise of the 90s, Cavs ownership felt the itch to just go get a superstar. Some things don't change. You got four people on Jordan. Some things never change. Uh, something uh, in the comments from, from a, a couple of days ago, we were talking about how people, it was uh, the USA basketball thing and how uh, uh, South Sudan was trapping our modern team. And we didn't know what to do against the trap. And uh, a comment brought up the Devin Booker thing because there's a, a clip of Devin Booker playing a scrimmage game, um, just like an exhibition game. And he was like bitching and complaining about them sending a double team on him. And he was like, come on, man, we're just we're, it's an exhibition. Like, why are you guys sending a double team? Like, we're really going to do this. And then Kobe's response to that whole thing was like, you better send another motherfucker after me. You know, like, like <laughs> better send another one. You know, that was him after he retired and he was still saying that stuff. But then modern players have no idea what it's like to get quadruple teamed and to still put up the amount of points you, you put up and also to shoot 50 percent while you're doing it. That's what makes Jordan a goat. An MJ of their own. It wasn't yet obvious, but Cleveland had royally whiffed a prime opportunity to get that guy in the 1996 draft. That night, the Cavs selected Vitaly Potapenko. Oh, then this guy looked like he belongs at Microsoft. Six draft. That night, the Cavs selected Vitaly Potapenko, 12th overall. Vitaly? Kobe Bryant was still on the board. Oh. And Pedro Stoyakovich. Oh. And Steve and Nash. Steve Nash. It looks pretty and bad. And Jermaine O'Neal. When you fail to choose the superstar that fell in your lap, and can't persuade a superstar to choose you, you gotta force the issue. Gordon Gund was done waiting, done settling for plan B. He wanted the guy, or, you know, as close to that as possible. The reluctant Embry thus swung a 1997 trade for disgruntled Sonics forward Sean Oh Kemp. boy, yeah, Kemp talks about this, and um, he regrets it a little bit, but this is just how he was at that time what he prioritized and his ego got to him. So he felt insulted with how much he was getting paid and he went for the money. But while he was hurt and feeling insulted by how much Seattle was paying him and, and what they were offering him, he became, or he began a drug habit. So what Cleveland inherited was now an overpaid, drug drug infused version of Sean Kemp and it did not go well at all it didn't go well for anybody and Sean Kemp regrets leaving Gary Payton to this day who Cleveland convinced to stick around with a huge new contract offer the move earned Embry another executive of the year award but while the Cavs pricey new star kept them above water he didn't take them anywhere of note Injuries and Kemp's declining condition prevented any renewed cohesion between youth and experience. The Cavs missed the playoffs of the 1999 lockout season, and soon thereafter, Gund cleaned house again. He fired Fratello and pushed Embry to resign the same year he entered the Hall of Fame. The Cavaliers crossed into the new millennium with new management, new coaching, and a roster in flux around the founder and Kemp. Ohio guy Jim Paxson took over and emptied the tank in order to, well, tank. Cleveland re-earned their old nickname with a squad comprising grumpy cast-offs and youngsters learning on the fly. There was promise, but not nearly enough. By 2003, the Cleveland Cavaliers owned, for the first time since the Stepien years, the worst record in 17 the wins. Gordon Gunn had saved them. Wayne Embry had rebuilt them in a flash, and Lenny Wilkins had led them. 
but injuries, desperate trades, and one bad, bad <laughs> man in red had snuffed their promise to become the team of the 90s. The Cavs exited the century. My brothers got, got those shoes. Snuffed their promise to become the team of the 90s. The Cavs exited the century hollow, barren, dead, again. And yet, here we are. The 2016 Cavs are full of talent, enough to win a championship if the next few seconds pass without mishap. Just seconds ago, Kevin Love, a player Cleveland acquired by trade, faced a tough matchup in the critical possession following Kyrie Irving's I'm calling point. it. They're totally going to lead this in to the third video. And I'm going to ask you all to vote now in the comments. Do you want me to cover the third part of this, which is going to be taking off when uh, LeBron takes over till 2021? So, yeah, it'll be the entire LeBron tenure. Let me know. Actually, this scene surfaces a long thread of Cavaliers history. Tug that thread with me for just a second. Remember Dick <laughs> Snyder, hero of the 1976 Miracle at No, Richfield? I didn't watch part one. Well, a couple years after he hit that game winner against Washington, Snyder signed with Seattle. Cleveland got a couple draft picks as compensation for his departure. That's how it worked back then. The Cavaliers used one of those compensatory draft picks to select Bill Lambeer. You remember oh, wow. him. In 1982, Ted Stepien traded the future All-Star to Detroit, which was bad. But in return, our friend Ted got a rare first-round draft pick. With that 12th pick in the 1982 draft, the Cavs selected John Bagley, the dude whose scouts ranked so much lower that they thought the pick was a joke. Remember that? Stay with me. So Bagley actually ended up being pretty decent. And in 1987, the Cavs used him in a three-team trade to acquire a guard coming off an intriguing rookie year in Utah. That was Del Curry, who played a very promising sophomore season with the 87-88 Cavaliers. At age 23, Curry broke out as one of the league's better three-point shooters. Surprise, surprise. He could have meant a lot to Cleveland, especially once they traded Ron Harper. But we know what happened in the 1988 expansion draft. Cavs GM Wayne Embry made the tough, regrettable decision to leave Del Curry unprotected. He chose instead to secure Chris Dudley, a shitty backup big man from Yale who had once been the bar fight partner of some kid named Brett Kavanaugh. In claiming the mistakenly unprotected Curry, Charlotte didn't just add an exciting young shooter to their new NBA franchise. Dell had just welcomed his first son to the world. Wardell Curry II was born at Akron General Medical Center in March of 1988. But because of his dad's job <laughs> Oh my transfer, God, look at little Steph. Look at little Steph. <laughs> wow. Wow. Little baby Steph. Wardell Jr. grew up in North Carolina. He doesn't Carolina. look so different now, does he? How was it that that face never changed? In North Carolina, he became a high school basketball star. In North Carolina, he played his way from obscure recruit to national star at Tiny Davidson College. The Golden State Warriors drafted Dell's son seventh in 2009, and he developed gradually into one of the sharpest shooting, slickest handling point guards ever to yeah, play yeah, basketball. Yeah, yeah, we all know who it is. And you've probably figured out by now that Wardell Curry II goes by his middle name. The baby gestated in Utah and born in Ohio, but raised in North Carolina because the Cavs wanted to keep Chris Dudley. I tell you, though, get rid of his facial hair, and he looks just like he did when he was a little kid. Grew up to become Stephen yep. Curry. This guy. Moments ago, Curry was in position to match Kyrie Irving's dagger three. This is his office, his hunting ground. Steph lives to pull up from deep in the clutch, as he demonstrated with a world-class finish just a few months ago in OKC. They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry, way down to Bang! Bang! Oh, what a shot from Curry! Mike Breen's voice probably still hurts from that <laughs> call, 
But you know he was getting ready for another bang moment. Because, yeah, this was a dangerous matchup. There you Horrific. go. Th- that, that was supposed to be the shot. He was supposed to be able to take the shot. But good defense, my love. Closed him out. For Cavalier fans. Kevin Love there you go. That's another one. To- but he's still on him. He's not being shook. Cleveland, but lockdown perimeter defender is not one of those things. Love scrambled to force a bailout pass, but Curry retrieved the ball from Draymond Green, pulled a few moves, and... Back, crossover, puts up a three. Well, I never really paid attention to this that much. He really should have taken... Love scrambled to force a bailout pass, that but shot. Curry... Re- I know it's crazy, but it's Steph Curry. And he would have had a wide open shot. And I'd give him 50% right there that he makes that. Wide open, non-contested. But I understand why he didn't take it. Because that's crazy to say. He's almost half court. But he could have bust- he could have hit that. But he ended up taking a contested sh- uh, shot instead. Retrieved the ball from Draymond Green. Pulled a few moves and... Yeah, that, that's, that's not a good shot. Wow. But three. Rebound, James. Phew. Bullet dodged. Admirable defense from Love. Yeah. The Cavaliers kept the lead and regained possession when the rebound fell to another person born at Akron General Medical Center. This person remained in Ohio and became the light at the end of a dark tunnel. While the greatest player of the 1990s destroyed Cavalier hopes, the greatest player of the 2000s was growing just a few miles away. Oh, Kobe was there? Tim Duncan was there? I didn't know that. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It's time to meet LeBron James. Good video. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Oh, all right. I mean, I kind of want to watch part three. So let me know if you guys are down for it. I'd, uh, I'd totally watch that with you guys on another one of these nights. Um, but yeah, good story. Good story. Um, I had no idea how much they were going to talk about all the, the, like the logistics of the Cleveland Cavaliers. But it was really cool stuff to learn. Um no surprise here. Michael Jordan and the Bulls dominated them year after year after year. And I tell you, there was something poetic about LeBron James in the very beginning, wearing that, that jersey number 23. There was something poetic about it. And I really thought he'd be that guy. You know, I thought he was going to be the next like Jordan kind of guy. Stick around during the hard times and build, build, build until you eventually win and then dominate. But he wasn't that guy, unfortunately. He eventually gave them one, but he had to rip their hearts out once already. Gave them one, and then ripped their hearts out again. Left them twice. You know, double divorce. But, you know, to his credit, you know, him and Kyrie and Love, they did deliver one. But, yeah. Anyways, guys, I'm going to head out for tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys had some fun. I definitely did. And, um, yeah, I like these longer form videos. This is good stuff. All right, guys, let me know what you think. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you want more content like this, if you do, I will see you very soon. And, uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out and watching with me, you guys. All right. Peace out.